welcome to Drinks Coach. Contact me on Vinesack or lowercase or Drinks Coach UK lowercase if you want to contact me through Twitter or Insta. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, I'll answer any questions. If you want to give me some idea of how you want this uh, channel to go, tell me which shows you like, which shows you don't like. Uh, you are watching YouTube. Ring the bell, press the button, subscribe. It's nice to have more subscribers and you'll be notified of new shows as they come in. They're slightly less irregular than they have been, but hopefully they'll come in at two a week as always. Um, yeah, because things are opening up, we're all having to start to work. Uh, so this is really the first time I've had to juggle my time between this show and things that actually pay the bills. So um, what we've got today, well, it's that time of the year. If you go right back to when we started this whole debacle, um, I did quite a lot of rosé tastings. And I think I got a bit giddy over Cote de Provence in 2019 because I loved them so much. Uh, and we did some very, very nice rosés on the show. Well, it's a, a year round and I've done my tastings. I've been to a lot of press tastings, supermarket tastings. I've had wine sent in. Here's my pick of the four Côte de Provence rosés, which you should look at, which I think are absolutely delicious. We're going to start off with this. These do some magnums, you know. This is the Côte de Valois en Provence. See that? Cote de Valois en Provence. Cote de Valois, the Var, is a very beautiful northerly part of the Provence. Very hilly, very beautiful. Um, this wine is made of a whole mix of different varieties. It's a typical blend. Um, it's Grenache based, but it's got Sanso, it's got Grenache, it's got Syrah, it's got blah, blah, blah. Um, but I taste this at the Marks and Spencer's press tasting. They do a perfectly good, perfectly serviceable Cote de Provence in that range that I was telling about, the classic range, if you go back to the Marks and Spencer's um, tasting. Just look, put Marks and Spencer's Drinks Coach UK in YouTube, they'll take you back. Um, but I was just a little disappointed in its concentration. But then, pay peanuts, get monkeys. Uh, Cote de Provence Rosé, good Cote de Provence Rosé, is £15 plus. Uh, and they were saying this wine at a very, very um, reasonable price. I can't remember precisely how much it was, but it was like £8 or something. But they do have this slight upgrade. This is £9.50. Um, yeah, you can buy a box of six for £57. Uh, what do I like about this? Well, it was a whole heap more stylish than their standard offering. Um, lovely colour. Beautiful, beautiful pale colour. Um, yeah... It smells like meadows. I can imagine standing on top of the, of the VAR, looking all the way across the main section of Provence, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, which is a good 15 miles, um, maybe longer, no, it's further than that, um, but surrounded by lavender fields, and you can smell the, the flowers and the grass. There's a little bit of spice. There's almost a bit of what we call garrigue, there's dry sage quality about it. You see, it's dry, but it's not dry because the acid in Provence Rosé is so low. It's just so sweetly succulent without actually having sugar in it, which is just such a nice thing to have. And this kind of Provence Rosé, this Valois style, is particularly suited, I think, to oysters. So if you like oysters, uh, fill your boots. Um, but that's a lovely, lovely drink. And um, for those people that were just looking for a bargain, you can stop the programme here. This is £9.50. There's probably all the rosé you need this summer. OK, but moving on. We're pimping up a bit. Well, now we're going to Majestic, where we're tasting a, a rosé which is a proper superstar of the region. This is from Chateau de Bern, one of the largest producers in the region, I think second largest. And they have uh, all sorts of associated estates, which I've told you about in the past. Last year, we had this beautiful bottle. you probably remember it if you've been watching these shows for a year. The Ultimate Provence, which is available in Waitrose, by the way, um, from next week at fifteen ninety nine. dollars This gorgeous bottle. A bottle that's virtually impossible to throw away. The whole house is full of these empty rosy bottles with bath salts and olive oil and vinegar in it. Um, it's getting a bit of a bind, to be honest. Um, but the other wine... Uh, kind of the, the, the estates of like flagship wine of this group is the Chateau de Burnt Ore Gold. Here we are. Look, have you noticed something? Flipping square bottle. One thing, if you're clever about marketing rosé, is that packaging does matter. It does matter. In the same way as it matters for champagne, probably more so than any other wine. I don't know why, but packaging in of itself isn't enough, is it? This is another Grenache-based Provence rosé from it's south of the Var, but kind of steads in the, in the heart 
of, of the Provence Rosé district. Uh, one thing I must tell you about this place is it does have the most incredible Michelin starred restaurant, five star hotel, pizza restaurant, wine shop. It's kind of like a one stop. If you're going to go to Provence and you want to hang out in, in a, in a, um, in a winery and, and make a day of it, this is as good as it gets. This is the ultimate, I think, in, in luxury um, wine tourism. And I, I strongly recommend it um, because it's all done so well. Um, the chap that owns this company is actually English. So you're not giving the French money that they don't deserve. <laughs> um, and uh, he was famous for producing these, um, you know, sort of like hot desking offices around the world in different capital cities. And he's called Regis. And man, I think made four billion out of it. And um, so this is one of the things he's invested in as a lifestyle choice. And uh, he's done an extremely good job of picking the right people to do the right things and to make the wine, particularly. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm supposed to go in there. Right. It's oh, delicious. Right, so I sent a bottle of this and Ultra Provence. This year, I think this wine is the better wine. It's so juicy, so succulent. It's almost like you're chewing on it, but it's light, like marshmallow, candy floss light. It's like drinking candy floss. Finishes with a lovely ping of acidity, nice round alcohol sweetness. This taste which reminds me of those little pink shrimps, those little sweets, a bit like that. Um, sort of grown up and not grown up, but it's a wine that you could drink all the way through summer and it's just absolutely fantastic. Well, I did say it was 15 99 but if you buy two, it's eleven ninety nine. Very good wine. Moving on to a wine which is its sister slash brother. I don't know what to say about this. We're all very non-binary these days, so apologies anyone I offended. Um, the LGBT version of this, uh, shall we say? Um, and this is Le Pigeonnier, uh, the Pigeon Loft. Um, and in this group of Ultra uh, Ultimate Provence and, and uh, Bern and so so forth, um, they have Saint Roux. This is Saint Roux. A beautiful package, beautiful label. Um, it has a beautiful organic restaurant on site again and a beautiful organic winery setting. Well, it's like Delsford Organic in the Provence. So if you drive a Porsche and live in Belgravia, what more, more do you want? This is the perfect holiday for you. Um, this wine is made very, very similar blend to the Saint Roux, but it tastes very, very different. Actually, I just poured some onto that. Let's try a different glass. Um, there we go. So what's different about this? It's 100% organic. A lot of organic farming, by the way, in Provence, because it's dry. You don't need to worry about mould and um, millerandange, as they call it, or mildew, because it's so dry and, and also windy. So um, it's kind of suited to you not using chemicals just for the sake of them. Um, and it always has, I don't know, a bit more character than the other wines. It's not always the best. Sometimes it you know, it has slightly dark underbelly, sort of unusual aromas. But I love it. It's always, because it's spontaneously fermented, it's not inoculated, that is, you don't add a yeast to it to make a pristine ferment, but you just have to wait until the bird flies over and the yeast falls off its leg into the, and starts to ferment. You have much more texture. You have much more mouthfeel. You have much more of a duvet structure in the mouth. And when you drink it, it tastes, if you like that sort of thing, a bit more busy. It's not simple. This is simple and calm and maybe swimming pool. This, there's little things going on. It's firing on different cylinders. It's, it's a little chatter in the background. This, this, this tastes like a bistro sounds. That was probably the weirdest thing I've said in weeks. Anyway, absolutely bloody delicious. Online, 14 to 15 pounds. So all these three... I think are what they call a fair price. This is a brilliant price to get Provence Rosé under a tenner still, knowing how much the grapes cost. Marks and Spencers, well done, all of you. These two wines are delicious. Again, I think I'm, maybe this one has it. Go to Majestic and buy that if you want something a bit more pimp. Um, but this has got something... And if you care about the ecology... Mm. Which is going to bring us on to this. Nick Darlington, if you're watching, of Graft wines or graft vines his company's called graft i know that we think that graft means hard work yeah well he does work very very hard but vines are grafted onto rootstocks <laughs> it's an in joke it's really funny um so this 
I drank um, with a very dear friend of mine. Um, <laughs> we were trying to date, actually. And um, she has a friend that has a house very near to here. And um, she likes to swim a lot. She goes for nine mile swims and things like that. And came back with a bottle of this. I don't know if she bought it in Duty Free or from the local wine merchants. Um, but said I had to try it. This is a Cote de Provence Rosé. But not as we know it, Jim. It doesn't look anything like the others, does it? Look. The, the bottle, for a start, is green. Who puts a pink wine in a green bottle? Because then it looks brown, which is fucking ridiculous. Anyway, sorry swearing, Emma. I know you don't like me to swear. But look, this is Clos Sibon, Côte de Provence. It's one of the f 11 Côte de Provences that's gi given the... the, um, the They're allowed to call themselves a crew classe because they're the top of the shop, if you like. But this is their classic wine from this estate. The bottle and the label, I think... Ah, uh, it's my favourite label in the whole of France, I think. It's just, isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> Not sure you can imagine a more sort of Jeanne de Florette label. When I look at that label, I hear the theme tune to Jeanne de Florette. It's 2019. This has just been released. So this is a year older, which gives you a kind of indication of uh, maybe this has got more chutzpah than the others. Um, but very importantly... This is made from a grape variety, or at least 90% of this wine is made from a grape variety called Tiburen. Tiburen, sometimes spelled without the U. But Tiburen, I mean, I could be making this up, but somebody once told Tommy this. The only Tiburen left in the world is in this vineyard. This is the last of the Tiburen in the known universe and on this lonely planet. And 10% of this wine is Grenache, which probably gives it a little bit of an alcoholic kick, a bit more sweetness. But Tiburen... It's just so nice for me in this business to know that there are wines which I like and a style that I like and that there are still things which are such precious, rare jewels which don't cost the earth. I mean, it's not cheap. This is a £25 rosé. £24.99 exact. Um, if I show you the colour, it's much more... It's not even pink. It's kind of a flesh colour. See that? And... Um, my friend, you'll know, um, he shall know who I'm talking about. Um, when we taste this, we, we, we came up with this idea about what's the difference between wine that's merely very good and wine that's amazing. I'm sorry, there's a guy with a bike around the corner who is just a tit. Anyway, we decided that a wine that's truly great, there's a degree of effortless in the wine. When you drink a wine, a great Chablis, a great Bordeaux, you don't go, oh, no, it's all in the right place. Oh, well done. You know, you've done it. You succeeded it. There's an imperious quality to the wine, which makes you feel humble to drink it. You're going, oh, well, they know what they're doing. I can't teach them anything. Um, and it would. my analogy would be, uh, I was once, because I did some work for Bentley, allowed to borrow a Bentley for a day, which was a great privilege and a great experience. Um, I'm still... Um, trying to make up for the carbon footprint that I created on that day. Um, but uh, going up a dual carriageway with three six foot five blokes in the car, my brother and two, two of his friends, and then you're in a motorway and he goes, well, you put the foot down, see how fast it goes. And you expect this kind of big, this this drama, this sort of kind of... No, it just goes... And it goes up to 2,000 revs. And you look down, you're doing 100 and something miles an hour. And it's the effortlessness in which a Bentley goes about his business that makes it worth 300 grand. And that's what makes a difference, I think, between a wine which is worth 50 pounds and a wine that maybe justifiably is worth double that. I I still struggle with the idea that wine should cost more than 100 pounds, but then pe people pay what they have to pay. And that comes down to rarity, not quality. Remember that. Anything over 100 quid, it's just down to more people wanting it than there is wine, basically. Um, but what we came down to is that there's an analogy with this. That the effortlessness of wine is a bit like this. A really, really good wine, you can see the detail. It's an emotional, or there's a connection with the wine, and you go, oh, that's delicious, mm, and I can taste this, I can taste that. Mm, textured, lovely. It feels very close up. It feels like, I don't know, listening to one of those amazing anthemic songs by Madonna in the 90s. You put it on a stereo, you feel like the whole song's swelling around your head. You feel like she's about, she's whispering in your ear and it's an amazing thing. But there's something that's still not great about that. What's great is standing or sitting in the Royal Festival Hall with um, Yo-Yo Ma on his own playing a cello and 3,000 people hanging on every drawstring. Just 
and just and there's a thing about distance now this wine tastes like a big thing in the distance rather than a small thing close up now <laughs> i don't really know why i'm saying this but i'm trying to try and explain the difference between 15 pounds and this is amazing wine for the price and 30 pounds and me going of course it's 30 pounds when you look at this wine it looks a bit strange you smell the wine <laughs> it's almost like you're looking for the smell and then little things pop up like you're looking at the scenery you could be in the surrey hills overlooking newlands corner and you're going oh look there's a church i haven't seen before and, oh look at that that looks like a very nice house and little details start to appear like in a russo painting And when you taste it, boy, is it austere to start with. It's like, it's like walking to a cathedral. You're like, am I worthy? And then flavours start to leak out into your mouth. Stones, peach, st wild strawberry, petrichor, that kind of smell of hot stones in the rain and... This doesn't happen by accident. This is a place where a variety is planted, a variety which I can't taste anywhere else, producing something which is not just a grand experience, but a completely unique one. See you next time.